Good morning. Okay, let's wake up. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. So it is a great pleasure for me to introduce my colleague, Associate Dean Jean Ferrante. She obtained her bachelor degree from New College and her PhD from MIT. Then she taught at Tufts University and has worked at IBM for 16 years before she came to UCSD uh, 14 years ago. So for her work in IBM, she obtained, she was given a, uh, a Programming Language Achievement Award by the Association of Computing Machinery. At UCSD, she founded the Teams in Engineering Service, a program that uh, partners multidisciplinary undergraduate students with uh, nonprofit organizations for long-term technical solutions. For this work and her other initiatives on, for women in engineering and women in leadership, she was given the Pinnacle Award by Athena. And she is also uh, leading a National Science Foundation funded effort on introducing high, uh, middle school teachers and students to information technology and engineering and environmental science. And in particular, to foster girls and minorities' interest in science and engineering. So clearly, she is a role model for all, especially for girls. Now today, she will talk about parallel computing. So uh, her husband, Larry Carter, also professor in computer science and a past uh, Cosmos instructor, will be her stage assistant. So let us uh, give them a warm welcome. Okay. Thank you, Charles. And uh, I'll also be assisted by Adam Peterson from Cosmos. And uh, Larry Carter will be serving as the game master. So what I hope to do today is to give you an idea about what parallelism is and why it's important. So most of my work, that um, Charles mentioned, has been in the area of high-performance computing. And the fundamental question that I've worked on for most of my career is, how do we get computers to run faster? And um, many of you know that you know, one answer to that is, just wait a little while and a faster machine will come along. Right? And so that's made the laptop of today be about what we considered the biggest, most powerful computer 25 years ago. So that's what's now sitting on your lap or on your desktop. But there's still the need for the large computers because we have problems that we can't solve on our laptops or even on servers. Okay? What are the kind of problems that push push the limits. Well, one example is predicting weather or predicting climate change. And there we, although we know about uh, how to do things locally, we often don't know how to put the different models that we have about, you know, what happens over the ocean versus what happens over a continent together. Uh, it's an enormous amount of data that we collect. And the physics is not very simple. It's complicated. Um, one of the things we have here at UCSD is an environmental uh, sustainability institute led by uh, some professors uh, in engineering. And one of the things they're trying to do is figure out how we um, can um, use uh, energy and predict climate change better. So another example of something that really pushes the limits is virtual reality or games. Okay. What we'd really like to be able to do is be able to be involved in a virtual reality or a game and have the changes that others see be instantaneous. Okay. Uh, and uh, what I've shown you here is an example of um, not a game, but uh, of something called reality fly-through that one of our uh, computer science graduate students did for his PhD uh, 
thesis, Neil McCurdy, with his advisor Bill, Bill Griswold. And uh, what they did is figured out a way of, if you have cameras covering an area and uh, they can't cover everything, how do you fill things in? So to someone viewing this, it looks totally seamless, like they're really in that environment. And so um, that's, that's the kind of thing that can really push the limits of, of computation. Oops. So what's the solution? And for most of what my work has been about is um, what I'm calling uh, parallelism. Okay. And we've all had the experience that if we have something to accomplish, some piece of work to do, that it can really help if we get others to join us on that. It can make things go faster. It can certainly make them go e more easily. Uh, and so the idea of parallelism, the intuitive idea is um, getting multiple workers to work on a project or a um, piece of work, not just one. In computer science, that's called working in parallel. Okay, so many processors simultaneously working on the same problem. And the idea being that by doing that, by getting all those processors working, you can uh, solve a, the problem more quickly. And what I've shown you here is just some examples of our engineering students working on teams. Uh, this is uh, some of the TIES teams. Uh, Charles mentioned the Teams in Engineering Service or TIES activity that we have here at UCSD. And this is some of our TIES teams working with their clients together in a multidisciplinary setting to help solve their problems. So what I hope to tell you about today is what it is to be running in parallel, I'll give you a little bit more of an idea about it, its advantages and disadvantages. Then we're going to have um, uh, some volunteers come up and help us illustrate uh, what parallelism can be about here on the stage. So we'll have three parallel activities, uh, let's call them games. And then, um, I'm get, just going to close by telling you why this is such an important problem now. You know, what, what's happening in technology today that's just making this really important for you all to be thinking about this. So, um, suppose you have some work. And I'm giving an example here of cooking a dinner. Okay? What you do in order to run that in parallel is you divide that big chunk, cooking dinner, into smaller chunks. So for instance, one task could be cook the chicken, another could be prepare the veggie, another could be cook the dessert. Okay? So we break it, the, the big thing, into smaller things, right? which we call tasks. And then um, the normal way to do things, or to think about doing things, is just to think about doing them, you know, if you only have one person, that one person has to do everything. So suppose they decided to first do the chicken, then do the veggie, then do the dessert. So there's an illustration of, uh, as time proceeds, one task at a time being done, okay? And you can see that, you know, you have to do, you do one, then you do the next, and you do the next. If you had three workers or three processors, and you assigned each a task, and you did them all at the same time in parallel, then, as you can see, uh, you could cut the time to one-third of what the original was. Everybody see that? Good. Okay, so um, I've shown you a picture that uh, indicates that uh, these tasks all take the same time, so, you know, cooking the chicken is the same as doing the dessert and so forth. That may not be the case. And um, we may not have exactly the same amount of processors or workers as we have tasks. So what would we do? So if we have more tasks than processors, then uh, what we do is start out by giving each processor one task. You know, so we've got a bag of tasks, and we start by giving one to each processor, let them start working. And then when a processor finishes, we give it a new one till we run out. 
So it's pretty simple. Uh, we just try to keep people as busy as possible. Um, and we might be, you know, a little clever about it. And if, in fact, the tasks that we have are not all at the same time, or we know one is going to take a lot longer, we might want to get that one out there right away. So if the chicken's going to take a lot longer than uh, the other two tasks, we, we give that to the first processor that comes along. And, and the result is uh, we get these done, hopefully, in less time than if we had done them one at a time. So one of the things in thinking about this, uh, uh, there has to be someone who's handing out the tasks or a, uh, uh, in, you know, in terms of the software, there has to be something that's giving the tasks out or a taskmaster. And that taskmaster could be a bottleneck. If you think about the, uh, here illustrated by the, the, the uh, pointy haired boss, um, if, if uh, you don't have a good taskmaster who's really on top of things, uh, you might actually have to wait to get your ne next task. So um, this sounds fine, but it's not always a win. And so I want to give you a feeling for what's really complex about what's going on here. It seems like a simple idea. Divide up the work get lots of people or workers to work on it with you. Well, one thing may be that the task may have constraints, okay? and we call those dependencies. Okay? So uh, one example may be that you need the um, output from, oops, you need the output from um, one task to uh, before you start the next. So for instance, if you're cooking the chicken and you're going to produce chicken stock and you need that to cook the broccoli, you can't finish the broccoli off till you get that chicken stock, right? So that's an example of what a dependence is. And um, that's a very important restriction on how you can do this handing out of tasks. Um, tasks also use resources. And you know, in computational terms, that can be uh, memory, different kinds of memory. Uh, but in terms of this analogy that we're making here about cooking, uh, an example might be uh, you have two workers and both want to use the mixer at the same time. And here you've got a fellow who you can just tell, you know, he's going to hold on to that mixer and he doesn't, you know, he needs it to do his brownies and that's it. You're not going to get a hold of it until he's ready. So um, even though we wa may want to keep workers busily working uh, on tasks, they may have to wait, partly because there's a resource that they need. Um, there's also, as you'll see as we run through these activities, too, more complexity in running things in parallel. It's very easy if you have one person and they know they have to do everything. They don't need any instruction on how to do it. They just do it, right? They don't need any communication with somebody else. In doing things in parallel, we, uh, particularly if you have um, thousands of tasks or many more than th that, you have to think about how you schedule those tasks. Okay? And um, it may be the case, too, that um, I have to, uh, uh, as a worker, have to communicate with you because I need a resource or I have to give you some data. The other thing is um, idle time, what we call idle time is possible, that um, a worker may need to wait for another uh, uh, result from another worker in order to go on. So. Um, and here, remember the, the pointy-headed boss. So um, finally, we, you know, I showed you some pictures where it seemed like the tasks were all finishing at the same time, but tasks may not all finish at the same time. And so you may get idle time uh, because of that. And so it may be that the way that the tasks were, alloc uh, were, were made, were, you may have some that were too big. And so splitting them up into smaller pieces and balancing the load better among the workers is a better thing to do. Okay. So um, now's the time we're going to move on to illustrating some of these ideas. And um, 
I, uh, this is going to be an active learning experience, so uh, we're going to be asking some questions or asking you to do certain activities so the people in the back uh, uh, will be involved as we go along. But at this point, I'm going to ask our uh, 32 volunteers to come up on, on stage. Um, As, as you come on stage, <laughs> notice that there's a blue line that starts here and it goes all the way back there and around there and ends up there. That's going to be important. Okay, so let me tell you a little something about what we're going to do. Um, we are uh, going to have three activities or games. And we're going to give our volunteers um, numbers. They're going to actually have three sets of numbers, one for each game. Um, and our uh, assistants will be handing out these uh, numbers. And the point of the game is to um, arrange themselves in order from smallest, which is going to be Adam, I guess, to largest, which I guess is going to be Charles now. <laughs> okay. And um, so um, what we're going to ask people to do is to arrange themselves in order, starting at smallest, or Adam, and going around in a circle around the stage, because there's so many people, um, to, and ending up at Charles or largest. Okay. And what we're going to do is... Uh, time these activities and see if we can learn something from the, the timing. So um, I'll wait till everybody has their number. Come on, guys, on stage. This way. Get a number. Okay, so as you can imagine, we've chosen the numbers, so <clears throat> this isn't going to be as easy as it sounds. Uh, so what we're going to do is, um, in this first activity, and I'm going to uh, start the timer in just a, um, a moment. We have everybody ready? Okay, so uh, what we're going to do is ask, the first activity is a free-for-all. So what we're going to do is ask you to arrange yourselves. So you're only going to look for the first game at your red number. You've got three numbers there. The first one's your red number. And any way you want, you're going to arrange yourselves by order of your red number. Um, and you're going to wind up with the smallest person at Adam going around the stage like you are now, and then the lar largest person at Charles. OK, ready, set, go. And everybody out there should be watching what's going on and figuring out anything interesting. If you can push back that way to make a little more room. Okay, when you think you're done, yell, done. <laughs> done? Okay. Okay, we have to have an inspection. Everybody look at your two neighbors and make sure that you're in the right place with respect to your neighbors. No? Okay, if you're not, um, do a swap, okay? Are you still in the right place now? Yeah, check, check that you're in the right place with respect to your new neighbor. Yep. Yep. Everybody in the right place? Okay. Anybody notice anything? <clears throat> what, what did it look like from the uh, audience? Chaos. Chaos? <laughs> did I hear chaos? That's exactly what I thought, too. <laughs> okay. 
So you notice that I gave them, uh, or nor Larry gave them no instructions. Just do it however you want. Um, Larry, did you want to add anything here? Um, I don't know if you noticed, but at the beginning, people were bunched up over there. Nobody's ended up over here. Why is this? <clears throat> What's that? <clears throat> yeah, I, the numbers, almost all of them started with six something or other. Uh, a bunch of fives. So <clears throat> I did this uh, a couple years ago with a group, and almost instantly they sorted themselves. The problem was everybody said, oh, I'm 1-6, so I'm going to move close to the beginning. And someone said, I'm 9-5, I'm going to move close to the end. And so everybody kind of instinctively moved to the right place, and they were sorted. It was just amazing. So I decided to give them harder numbers so that uh, everybody would be crunched together there. And there were sort of like two crunches, and then they eventually uh, spread themselves out with a little bit of encouragement. And the final time was? 51 seconds. That's pretty good. Have a hand. OK. So now we'll go on to our second activity. Honor your neighbor. You've already gotten a little bit of practice. So we're going to use the blue numbers. Um, and um, again, it's going to be the same thing. Arrange yourself in order of blue numbers, except now we have some rules. Okay. The rules are you can only ask your immediate neighbor, either the person to your left or the right, assuming that there is one, um, what their number is. And if they're busy, you have to wait. You can't do more than one at once. And you're going to compare numbers. And if you're in the wrong order, you're just going to do a swap between those two. So you, and you can only change one place at a time. So if the numbers were, if you were 22 and the numbers between you were 17 and 10, you go to the end. You know, you, you, your 22 goes to the end, but you can't both do a switch at the same time. Eventually, that'll happen. OK? So, so pe people in the audience, uh, one thing you might want to do is pick your favorite person, somebody in your class, and try to get a sense of uh, how smoothly they move from their starting place to ending place and how many other people they have to interact with. OK. Ready, right. set, go. Comparing with your neighbors? Okay. Uh, are you comparing with that person? You should be. Keep working. <clears throat> I'm the taskmaster. Get to it. Okay. <laughs> One lone task left to go. I was like way down there. Okay, done? Not quite. Not quite. Not quite? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, no, no. Done. Okay, 134. One minute 34. All right, let's hear another hand. Okay, the final activity. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, sorry. Uh, debrief. <laughs> what happened? This took longer. Why did it take longer? <laughs> because this why? This shows that anarchy is a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> because there were rules. Okay. Yeah, uh, but the rules actually um, meant that people could only do small movements, right? Yeah. So you'll notice that 
almost everybody was in the right place and a few stragglers took a long time to finish. And they took a long time, why? They, they had to just move one at a time all the way over the, from all the way over there, all the way over here. So if you're like into computer science, you can think about how many comparisons were necessary for this activity to work. And if this doesn't mean anything, you don't worry about it. But the typical person had to compare themselves with about half of the other people. So if there were 32 people and the typical person had to compare with 16, that's about 512 comparisons had to occur. Uh, so it's a lot of work. Uh, and it turned out to take longer. I'm, I'm disappointed, but <laughs> you guys are too good with the free-for-all. Uh, but with, the, uh, with this method, because there's so many comparisons to have to go on, and some people had to do 32 comparisons, uh, it took a long time. Uh, any comments from people here on the stage? Who didn't have to move hardly at all? Okay, I have a comment. So I moved that way, and then I ended up back where I was. So I could have stayed. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> okay, anyone else wind up where they started? And then two people moved all the way from the end to the beginning? Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else want to make a comment? All right. So we'll go on to the final activity, which is group merge. And this one is going to take a little bit longer um, instructions. Okay, so it's going to be with your green numbers, but now notice there are more rules. Sorry for your anarchists, but um, so what we're going to do is divide you basically randomly into four groups, okay, in the four corners of the stage. So one group is going to come here, one group there, one group there, one group there. And uh, if you want to just stay in the order you're in, that's, that's fine, and you know, the eight, eight people here, eight people there, etc. Then what we're going to do is uh, we're going to do uh, a little choreography. Um, so um, when you get with your group of eight, you can, again, arrange yourself in order however you want. But once you get in that order, we're going to have um, Larry and Adam uh, help you merge your lines together in, in order. So the two groups, the, the, the uh, front and the back group on each side is going to do a merge. And then when those groups are merged, we're going to do one big merge. Okay? And that's a picture sort of illustrating the four groups and how we're going to do these two merges. Any questions from our participants? Well, let, let's start with getting groups of eight, uh, actually seven. I want seven people right here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven people back there. Uh, seven people over here. And there should be seven left over, six left over. Okay, so form a, a huddle, a group, uh, with, with your group members. So the flow is going to go, this group will send its smallest number this way, you'll send your smallest number this way, you two will meet, and the smallest number will proceed out this way. You're, don't, don't, don't look at your numbers yet. <laughs> no, no looking at numbers yet. Uh, you're going to take your smallest with your smallest, going to meet at Adam, come here, and then Charles is going to be responsible for sending you out that way. And you're going to just, we don't need the signs. Um, and then the, uh, we're just going to move off stage, I think. Okay, any questions about this? Um, okay, so people from here and here merge through me. Those two groups merge through Adam. The final result merges through Charles, and we're responsible for making sure that the smallest number goes. Are you ready? Go. Okay. Go. Excellent. You're 17. <laughs> Uh, send them off stage. Get out of here. <laughs> Clogging up the works. Bottleneck. <laughs> You're finally free when you figure out. <laughs> you too, come here. Oh. Processor failure. 
That guy's a good processor. He knows what he's doing. <laughs> hurry, hurry. <laughs> You'd already compared. <laughs> yeah. Hey, let's thank our participants. Okay, so the time for that final one was 1 minute 17 seconds. Ah. <laughs> and I think if we had done this maybe later in the afternoon, uh, it would have been faster. <laughs> but first thing in the morning, it's, it's hard to, to get along. So one thing about this is that um, this activity required um, uh, more um, large activities, okay, there were these merge activities. Um, did you want to add some uh, comments, Larry? Yeah, uh, remember I said the previous one there was everybody had to interact with about half the people. Uh, question is how many people did you have to interact with this time? Um, it's kind of a complicated question, uh, but you, you had your group of eight here, so maybe you had to interact with all seven of them. And then typical person had to wait once every time you got to a merge point because they <clears throat> had to watch two people go by before they got to move in. So if you count seven plus two plus two, it would be 11 rather than 16 on average that you had to interact with. And so it should be a little bit faster and the signs show that it was. So it kind of worked. It's still amazing that chaos wins, but that's life. <laughs> so the anarchy, the anarchists win this this round. Okay, so uh, what I'd like to do now is move uh, and uh, finish with just telling you why this uh, notion of parallelism that you now are uh, uh, familiar with is important. And so. Um, want to tell you first about two trends in technology. Um, first uh, um, is uh, something that was predicted by Gordon Moore, uh, the co-founder of Intel, long time ago, 1965, uh, but has turned out to be absolutely true. So it's not really a law, but it's called Moore's Law, okay, with quotes around the, the, the law part. And what uh, Moore predicted is that the um, number of transistors on a chip would double roughly every year and a half. Okay. So there would be two times the number of transistors on a chip every 1.5 years. Um, so uh, if you think, uh, so transistors are basically the building blocks of, of chips. And so that's saying that these chips are just becoming denser. They're just more building blocks sort of crowding in. Okay. Um, what's on the left here is um, a graph that's kind of illustrating this history with Intel chips. Uh, on the top are the years, uh, starting from 1965, 75, 80, so forth, uh, till 2000. So this is um, uh, not a new chart, but it's, it's still holding now. And on the left, which is cut off a little bit, um, are, are the um, numbers of transistors, but where you're multiplying by um, 10 every time with each line. So, and that's why this, is, uh, this line is showing up to be a line because it's really a log scale. And so it's indicating that there's some kind of doubling or 10 times in going on. Uh, I'll just mention that on the right in this uh, is um, uh, the clock speed. Um, that is the speed at which the, the, the chip is running, and that's more than doubling. That's, that's actually going quite a bit. So what we observe uh, has been going on over this history is that microprocessors, microprocessors have become, or chips, have become smaller and uh, 
what I really mean by that is they're, 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 we can pack more on in the same area uh, and faster. Okay, faster is not necessarily part of what Moore was predicting, his law. He was just saying that there's going to be a lot more stuff there, okay? And that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to run faster. So um, let's take a look at that. So this is another technology trend. And the, um, what this is showing you is uh, on the bottom is, is uh, years. And uh, as we um, go up um, on the left, it's uh, power density or watts per square centimeter. OK, so uh, what is this saying? And then uh, so what's illustrated here are some of the same um, uh, power, uh, some of the same chips, but uh, at their power, power density um, graphed on this graph, and when they were, uh, when they come out, and um, what their power density is. And so, uh, what this is showing is that uh, the power to actually run a chip um, is getting um, really enormous. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we're, we're up to the, almost the nuclear reactor in terms of the density. And, you know, you don't want to walk around with, some, with a, something that has the power density of a nuclear reactor. But you are, okay? But the problem with it is, is that we can't really go too much further here, right? What's happening is that we're putting so much power in order to use these transistors and power them up and get things to run faster that we're approaching a limit, okay? And uh, so power has become the biggest issue now with, um, with density. And so uh, there's a quote here from um, Dave Patterson, who's a, a professor at Berkeley. Um, Pretty soon we can put more transistors on a chip that we can afford to turn on. We just can't use them all. And this is the, the uh, paradox that we're involved in right now. So just to summarize why parallelism is important now, everything's getting smaller. This uh, line at the top is just another way of viewing Moore's law that we saw on the other slide. Um, what it is is it's just um, uh, widths going from an angstrom, which you can think of as like an atom, or it's, it's, it's a, uh, uh, comparable to an atom, uh, to a meter. And you're multiplying by 10 with each vertical line. And so what's illustrated here is that um, uh, chips are uh, about 10 or 20 um, uh, millimeters. Um, and the feature width that's over on the right, that's about the size of a transistor. Notice that's getting uncomfortably close to the limit because, and I, you know, we're not going to do things that are on the, uh, on the width of, of an atom. It's just not going to happen. Um, we really do have a fundamental limit there. Notice also that transistors um, uh, are, uh, uh, have feature width smaller than the wavelength of light. I mean, we think of light as being like really fast, but in fact, um, we have to use X-ray lithography now to make chips because the wavelength of light is too long. So that's pretty mind-boggling. So um, Moore's law says we're getting these Moore transistors on a chip. Doesn't say anything about chip speed. Um, in order to use all those transistors, we have to um, use more power. And one of the things we've been doing is upping the speed of the, of, of the clock in the chip. Okay? And um, you know that makes a lot of sense if you think of upping the speed of the clock, it's like being able to fast forward a movie, you know? You get to the end a lot faster, right? But it turns out that to up that clock speed, you also need more power, okay? So we're kind of running up against this, this um, limits now. The chips are running um, so fast that we're, they're in danger of melting, okay? And so um, we can't have the chips run much faster. What are we going to do? How are we going to use all these transistors? And um, what we're going to do is ease up on power and clock speed, but we're going to run in parallel. Okay? And that's, what, uh, that's why this has become so important now. So um, 
Computers are being made now out of what, we're, uh, what uh, we refer to as cores. Okay, a core is just a processor with some memory. And what we do now is put a bunch of cores, say four or eight, uh, together on a chip with a fast connection. And that's where the name multi-core comes from. Okay? And so each of those are really processing units in and of themselves. And so uh, a chip is what you normally get for processing in your laptop or your PC. Okay? But then we've come to a convergence of technology where we now take these chips and bundle them together. Uh, so a bunch of chips plus some maybe slower memory gives us a server. Okay? And so the servers that Google uses would be you know, on, on the order of um, something like that. And then finally, supercomputers, we take a bunch of nodes and we connect them up together because we still have supercomputers because we still got these problems that we don't know how to solve and we need the, the biggest computing power that we can get. So this is basically how um, the landscape of what machines look like looks like now. It's simpler, which is nice. It makes things cheaper to produce if we can build components out of other components. Um, but at the basis of everything are these chips with multiple cores. Okay, so all computers now are multi-core. Okay, um, Intel has been my example here. I never worked for Intel, so that's uh, I'm not uh, promoting them, but they are um, one of the biggest chip manufacturers. Uh, they currently have two to two to eight on a on computers that are out there on your uh, laptop or desktop, but They've got um, research chips that are, have 80 cores. Um, and um, predictions, um, uh, and th these predictions come from Fran Allen at, at IBM, um, range to you know, hundreds and thousands of these on a single chip. So the challenge is, how are we going to take advantage of those? Okay. And um, Bill Gates, who I assume you all know who Bill Gates is, uh, chairman of Microsoft, said this year, um, we have never had a problem to solve like this, okay? And we need a breakthrough uh, in how applications are going to use multi-core. So um, Microsoft and many people in computer science are worried about this. So. In conclusion, I want to just give you what some of these challenges really look like. And the really fundamental questions, how can we find enough parallel tasks okay, um, for running even eight cores, which exist today, on programs that already exist? So this is what Microsoft is worried about. How do they take a program like Word and make it run faster by using these multiple cores? Okay. But then um, we also are going to, we know we continue to write new programs, so how should we, you know, in the best of all possible worlds, write programs for multi-cores? Multi forget about Word, let's just assume that, you know, we're writing something from scratch. How do we take advantage of these cores? We really don't have a systematic way of doing that for all kinds of applications. And what happens when we get to 1,000 or maybe even 10,000? Okay. Um, our experience in uh, high-performance computing is that when you go up a scale like that, you have to think about things really differently. So uh, this has caused um, John Hennessy, a computer scientist and also the president of Stanford, uh, to say this is the biggest problem com computer science has ever faced. And to end on a note of optimism, Fran Allen, uh, IBM fellow and uh, also the 07 Turing Award winner. The Turing Award is the biggest prize in computer science that uh, we give out. Uh, says optim optimistically, this is the best opportunity that computer science has to improve productivity, performance, and the integrity of their system. So I'd like to leave you with the challenge of being part of that computer science revolution to figure out how multi-core can make the world a better place. OK, uh, thank you.
have time. So now we have some time for Q and A. Yeah. So are there any questions? How did I know that I wanted to? Uh, well, actually, I didn't know I wanted to work with computers. When I, um, uh, so when I went to uh, high school, I thought I wanted to become um, a teacher in uh, K through 12. Uh, but then I, when I went to college, I thought I would study chemistry. But what happened was I, I got into a math class and had a wonderful uh, teacher. And I got really fascinated by math. So I was really a, a math major. And so um, when I went to graduate school, I thought I would um, get my PhD in, in, in math. And, uh, but then when I got to graduate school, I decided that I was really more interested in um, the foundations of uh, computing. Because um, in order to really uh, figure out how things work, you have to break the, 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 the methods down into very small steps. And so um, I became fascinated with uh, the complexity of uh, how uh, fairly simple procedures are, um, can be shown to be complex, can be proved to be complex. Uh, and so I, um, uh, but I, I think I really, really, truly got interested in computer science when I when I went to. So I got my degree in, in actually in math, but I worked with someone in computer science, and that's because I didn't have to get a master's degree in um, in in uh, math, and I did in computer science if I switched. So it was you know laziness on my part. But um, I think I really, truly got into computer science when I went to work for IBM, um, which is a very project-oriented place. In fact, that's where I met Larry. And Larry is uh, my husband, uh, even though we have different last names. We're, we came here together as a, a package deal from IBM. Uh, and, um, but at IBM, I really got involved in uh, this high-performance computing area. And actually, most of the time, worked with Fran Allen who um, is still one of my mentors. Another question. It's pretty much here now. <laughs> yeah, because, if I could answer that. Oh, uh, the, so the question is, um, you, uh, I said that power density is, is pretty much taking us to a limit uh, in terms of having computers run faster, and when is that? And the, the basic answer is now. Uh, but Larry, you want to comment? If you notice the Intel chips that you can buy these days, um, <clears throat> there's like 2.8 gigahertz or 3 point something gigahertz. Those numbers have stopped going faster. In fact, if you look at the uh, newest offerings, they tend to ease off back to like 2 or 1.5 gigahertz as they go to multi-core. So we're at the stage where they've stopped using the power to make it go faster uh, because the chips are getting too hot. Yeah. And so that's why, you know, we, we will experience, um, we will not continue to have this experience that computers will run faster unless we can use these multiple cores. And that's why this is such a crisis. Uh, so the, the question was, what were the expected results of our uh, three activities? Um, and and do, did you mean in terms of the time or just what we? Order. Oh, order. So um, uh, order, we just expected you all to figure out the order and, and using the rules of the game. Um, and you know the answer in the end was the same for, uh, but you just had different sets of numbers. And the reason that you had different sets of numbers is once you did the first activity, you were already in order. So we had to give you a new, new, new sets of numbers as you went along. Yeah, like, did you expect the free fall to be the slowest or the second slowest? Yeah. So you're absolutely right. So the question was, what did we expect in terms of timing? So we did expect the chaos to be more chaotic and so that it would take you longer time. 
I was worried that it would take too long and I'd have to stop it because it would be <laughs> going on for five minutes. I was amazed how fast it went. Uh, so score one for chaos. Uh, uh, but it, 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 one thing is that um, we didn't talk about that um, we also had to spend some time giving you instructions and um, didn't really count that time in the, in the timings. And that's one of the overheads of parallelism. That's one of the things that when you're really going to orchestrate computations, there is overhead involved. You will be executing extra instructions and doing extra work in order to make them parallel. So there's always an overhead. But if, the, if you have enough parallelism, that overhead gets amortized over time. And you know, maybe we just had to have, you know, we couldn't fit 100 people on the stage or everybody on the stage. But you know, if we had had more people, the chaos would have, I think, taken a lot longer. Question in the back there. Sorry? What do I think of quantum computing? Uh, I think it's, um, it has a long way to go to be a realistic um, computational medium. Um, there in the middle? Uh, <laughs> you want to answer that one? We're not experts in quantum computing, but. Uh, it, it makes use of some incredible physics that allows you in a single electron or a single waveform to encode multiple possible outcomes and to do operations that in some sense uh, try all of them out simultaneously and then settle in the state that gives you uh, the one that you're looking for. Uh, a problem with quantum computing is you can't do general purpose computing. You can only do very specialized types of computations, such as factoring numbers, for instance. Uh, so first of all, the devices, the ones that exist so far, can only have on the order of 1,024 possibilities, uh, which is a very small number. You need billions of possibilities or quadrillions. And the other is that um, <clears throat> you can't use it for most computations. You can only use it for a special subset. Okay, do we have time for just one more? One more? Um, so the question was, uh, was I thinking about software or hardware? Is that, is that a... a Um, so the question was, was I thinking about um, uh, the dividing up the, the uh, work or the tasks or um, somehow thinking about the... Writing new code or using existing code and dividing it up somehow? Oh, um, so if it's writing new code or taking existing code and uh, dividing it up, the answer is yes. That is, we really need to do both. What Microsoft is worried about is that, uh, and, and other software developers, they have all this code that they need to now be running on multi-core. So they've got to figure out how to take their existing programs and adapt them. And uh, one of the things we've learned from high performance computing is that's very hard to do automatically. Okay? It takes a lot of human effort. Um, for new code, you know, in some sense, that's the more exciting, writing new code. Uh, what we really need are new languages uh, and ways to specify how we're taking advantage of the cores and how things are being directed at different cores and how the cores can actually work in uh, concert together. And so that's, you know, one of, one of the biggest challenges is for, is for, um, and that I would urge you to think about, you know, are there ways when you, when you're, when you start, you know, writing programs, think about, you know, is there a way I could break this up and that, you know, I could make these pieces independent or almost independent? Yeah. Um, so that's the kind of thing that we would have to think about. And the chunks would have to be of the size that are appropriate for what um, can fit in the memory of a core. Okay. And then if they have memory that they share together, what we would put in that memory. 
So it becomes a very, um, you know, uh, we, we didn't talk at all about memory here and about uh, moving data around, but that's really probably the biggest challenge is not really so much the computation, but how we're going to orchestrate all the data that has to be flowing through as we do the computation, okay, and what the limitations are. Thank okay. you. Wonderful. So let's thank Professor Jim Francis. Oh, and, uh, Becky Hames, uh, Cosmos program manager, for giving some token of appreciation.